Okay, well, welcome everyone. Very warm welcome. Well, I won't say warm because <laughs> this must be the coldest Whitson that uh, I, I can remember for a very, very long time. Um, but welcome anyway. Welcome to uh, St. Wilfrid's on this very, very special day, the day of Pentecost. A young boy came home from school one day and proclaimed very proudly, there's a new girl in our class, mummy, and she's Indian. Oh yes, says mummy. Does she speak much English? No, said the boy, but that doesn't matter. She laughs in English. Today we celebrate that great multilingual festival of joy, which is, no, not Eurovision, but uh, Pentecost. Pentecost AD 30, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. And thank you at this point, I'll say thank you to our occasional choir for blessing us with at least four languages uh, in our worship today, this morning. See if you can spot them all. We just had Yoruba, uh, one of the Nigerian languages. Um, let's see if you can spot the others as we go through the service. It's often said that God has a brilliant sense of humor. And uh, I came across this little saying the other day, which really tickled me. Um, I'm not sure it's totally scriptural, but uh, it made me laugh anyway. And behold, God promised men that good and obedient wives would be found in all corners of the world. And then God made the earth round and laughed and laughed and laughed. Have you ever thought of Pentecost as demonstrating God's sense of humor? Um, Acts chapter 2 is just full of really good gags and one-liners. I love Peter's retort, you know, when some of the crowd is sort of say, oh, they're, they're drunk, you know, and Peter, quick as a flash, comes back. How can we be drunk? It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. As in, you know, the taverns aren't open yet. And if we are drunk, boy, did we have a skinful last night. But actually, at the heart of the miracle of Pentecost itself, there is, a, there is God's sense of humor. Um, so let me read verses 6 and 7 of Acts chapter 2 again. So at the sound, the, the sound of the believers praising God, the crowd gathered and they were bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, why did they say that? Well, Galileans, so the commentators tell us, were not easy to understand at the best of times. They were apparently notorious for their thick northern accents, because that's where they were from, up north, uh, as far as Jerusalem were concerned. So in our own part of the world, maybe you'd like to think about uh, Geordies or Glaswegians, or uh, God forbid, uh, people from Belfast. I used to have the joy of going over to Belfast uh, with work, and um, <laughs> it was only ever like a, de a day trip at a time, and it took me a whole day to kind of tune into the accent. Um, but by then it was too late because I was back on the plane. Um, and I just felt like, say, slow down, slow down. <laughs> oh, they speak so fast. But anyway, think of people like that. Uh, as you imagine this crowd's reaction to these Galileans. So that's the miracle because suddenly not only could these Galileans, who normally nobody could understand anyway, make themselves perfectly understood in, in the lingua franca, uh, of Greek, but they were understood by each and every nationality as there was this big international festival as there was every uh, Pentecost, this big international festival, people coming from all corners of the Roman Empire into Jerusalem. 
And yet they heard the praises of God from the mouths of Galileans, of all people. Uh, They heard the praises of God in their own language. So there's humor. There is humor at the heart of Pentecost. But above all, I would argue, there is joy. And uh, I, I was... I was Googling for um, a joyful image of Pentecost. And it's harder than you imagine <laughs> to find a joyful image of Pentecost. If you go on, go on Mr. Google and, uh, or Mrs. Google um, and you... Well, I, I just put in joyful Pentecost. And still, most of the images that came up, you know, I must say, most of the apostles or disciples, they were still looking very glum and very gloomy, even though this miracle was happening to them. Uh, as if holiness and humor somehow, you know, aren't allowed to mix. But the, the one image that I did come across, which really struck me, was the one that uh, you've got on the front of your orders of service today. It's actually from a, a Christian community uh, in Cameroon. And yes, Hallelujah, some of the people in that picture are smiling. Uh, There is joy in that picture. Now, here's a bit of autobiography. I don't know whether I shared this before, but um, I was ordained in the mid-90s. For those of you who kind of knocked around church circles in the mid-90s, you will have remembered uh, the renewal movement. Anyone remember the renewal movement? Um, which was kind of big in lots and lots of different denominations, including uh, the Church of England. Um, and I was curate in, in a church, which I guess you would say was, was from a, quite a charismatic um, tradition. So they were very into the renewal movement. And um, does anyone remember the Toronto Blessing? The Toronto Blessing. I think that was towards the end of the 90s, I seem to remember. It was around the time of the Good Friday Agreement, um, which is interesting. Um, anyway, if you remember, if you know what I'm talking about. So Toronto, there was this church in Toronto. I think it was the Vineyard Church in, in the airport, Toronto Airport, or near Toronto Airport. Um, very strange things were happening to this church. Um, suddenly, people in that church... Uh, they, were, they were trying their best to have, the, you know, their kind of regular worship services, but they would, they would end up collapsing in giggles. Um, and this happened again and again and again, and people were kind of scratching their heads and wondering, what on earth is going on? And then eventually people visited this church, um, and, and they took this laughter back with them to wherever they went, and, and this became an international thing. And I, I remember... I remember very vividly a, a, a meeting that, would, that had been organized in Manchester. And uh, the people who'd organized the meeting were people who'd been over to this church in Toronto and uh, to, to bring the blessing back. And um, it was such a strange experience. I still don't know what to make of it today. But um, I just remember this, this laughter. And I remember it being so liberating and I remember it was a little bit like being drunk um, without the alcohol. And um, this must have lasted two or three days. I just remember feeling absolutely light as a feather and feeling as if nothing mattered in the world. <laughs> you know, and, and, and finding humor in everything. It was really, really strange. I, I still don't know what to make of it. And for many people, the jury is out still on the Toronto blessing, but as Jesus said, you know, be be very careful about speaking ill of the Holy Spirit, so I don't. But that's the kind of experience, that's the kind of experience that I think Luke is writing about in Acts Acts chapter 2, this accompanying this miracle of, of communication is this great, great sense of joy. But it's not just about the experience. And God forbid that we should ever just want the Holy Spirit in our lives because of 
the experience. Churches can go very wrong very quickly when they do that. But it's about the meaning behind the experience. And there are two mind-blowing truths behind the miracle of Pentecost, which I'd just like us to think about for a few minutes. First of all, God speaks in languages that people can understand. God speaks in languages that people can understand. That's, that's incredibly good news, and that's incredibly reassuring. God is keen to reach out to people. God is keen to communicate with people and speak to them in words, to speak to them in terms that they can relate to. Now, sometimes, again, when you look at the life of the church, you do wonder whether we are in step with this God who is so keen to speak to people in words that they understand. Uh, I might have had a moan about this before, so bear with me, but the baptism service, um, particularly the, the, the form it came out in the year 2000, the year 2000, we had a new prayer book in the Church of England, Common Worship, and the baptism service, thank God we don't use it anymore. We use, as many churches do, we use a, a more simplified version um, which has been authorized. But that original service, apparently you, needed, uh, you need a reading age of 18 to understand that service, which most people in the UK don't have. So well done, Church of England, uh, on that one. Uh, and no wonder that service has been simplified. The Roman Catholic Mass as well, this is funny. Any, any of you who are from that tradition or you know people from that tradition, my Roman Catholic colleagues have a real moan. There's been a, a revision recently of, of, of the Mass, the words of the Mass, and for some strange reason, the word cup has been replaced by the word chalice. Now, I don't think Jesus, one, first of all, I don't think Jesus would have been using a chalice at the Last Supper. Secondly, again, how many people in the general population know what a chalice is? So, being in step with the Spirit, I think, is about communicating with words that people understand. And, of course, that, that's something that is particularly urgent, I think, for us and for many churches and Christian communities around the world as we seek to recover, as we seek to, re to rebuild. We are seeking, I guess, like never before, to reach out to the people around us. Um, but in that, we need to make sure we are communicating well. And you can have all the focus groups in the world, of course, you can have all the you can do all the kind of market research and everything. But what Pentecost teaches us is that above all, we need to pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit in that reaching out, in that seeking to communicate afresh. We can do it on our own strength and we can have quick successes. But above all, we need to be that prayerful church that waits on the gifts and the talents of the Holy Spirit, particularly in terms of communication. And take heart wherever you're from, even if you're from Newcastle or Glasgow or Belfast. The Spirit will help people <laughs> to understand you. Um, second mind-blowing truth, and this is astounding, everyone but everyone is invited to be vessels of the living God. And there is no exclusion. That, this is the good news that Peter expounds on. After the experience, there's this sermon, and in, with reference to the prophet Joel, Peter preaches that this invitation for God himself to be living in our own hearts and minds this invitation is open to everyone. It's open to young and old. It's open to male and female. It's open to slave and free. Nobody is excluded. 
And just as every adult eventually is going to be invited for that all-important vaccine, so uh, it's the same principle. Everyone is invited. Everyone is invited to share in this gift. If they have open hearts and open minds, if they uh, look to Jesus as their saviour, as their Lord, then they can have this amazing, this amazing privilege in their lives. And of course, this is an incredibly unifying idea. Everyone is invited. And the other thing that kind of passed through my mind, of course, in reading this passage afresh this year, is the contrast between this incredible miracle of communication and unification in, of all places, Jerusalem, when we think about what's been happening in Jerusalem over the last few weeks. And no, God will not be laughing at that. He will be weeping. And we weep too. And we pray for a lasting peace. So God speaks to us in a language that we can understand. And everyone but everyone is invited for the living God to be living in their hearts and lives. If we never smile or laugh at anything else in the world, these two truths alone are definitely worth smiling about and even laughing about. So have a joyful Pentecost. Alleluia.